fans of this sport are built differently. They demand excellence and expect nothing less. Big Ten Wrestling and Beyond is a show dedicated to the fans. Your new home for Big Ten Wrestling is here, and it starts now. And welcome in once again to Big Ten Wrestling and Beyond. Rick Pizzo, thrilled to be joined, as I always am, on the show by Shane Sparks. Shane, it's hard to believe we are done. Big Ten Conference Wrestling, the dual schedule finished up this past weekend. Now we start to get ready for Big Ten Championships and, of course, the NCAAs. This season has flown by, but some really good action this week. Everybody's Big Ten schedule is over. Handful of teams with some non-conference. But you know who was busy this weekend, Rick? The scoreboards. RBY with 28 points. Jack Medley, Michigan, puts up 24. And the true freshman from Ohio State, Jesse Mendez, 22 points. Guys finding their offense heading into championship season. I'm glad you went there because our weekly headlines begin with the point barrage that Penn State dropped this weekend, once again clinching the Big Ten dual season. That's no surprise. But to do it in the fashion that they did it in, scoring about 80 points, but also 80 individual match points in terms of takedowns. Those are absolutely crazy numbers as Penn State remains undefeated in the Big Ten, undefeated overall, and the clear favorite to win the Big Ten's and NCAAs as long as everybody wrestles as they should. And how about Merrill and the Terrapins? Turtle power, they get it done. Their first Big Ten dual meet victory since 2016 as they knock off Purdue 1918. They were down late, but they get a pin from Jackson Smith at 197. Jared Smith at heavyweight 3 2, and they are going crazy in the path for the Terrapins. Iowa had one of its most impressive performances of the year in a dominant victory, 33-8 to over Michigan. Now, to be fair, and Tom Brand said it afterwards, Michigan didn't roll out a couple of their better wrestlers, but still, from weight class to weight class, the Hawkeyes are really good. Shane mentioned some non-conference matchups this weekend. Iowa gets Oklahoma State. That's a great tune-up for the postseason for the Hawkeyes. Nebraska with a great finish. They finish in the Big Ten 7-1. They go to Columbus inside the Cavelli Center. They beat the Buckeyes on Friday. Then they go back home to Lincoln on Sunday and they beat Rutgers. Liam Crone in a pair of hard-fought victories. Brock Hardy's been great. Peyton Robb, Mikey Labriola, they remain undefeated and Silas Allred continues to impress at 197. I love what I have seen from Mark Manning's team this year. Nebraska is a team to watch at the Big Ten Championships. Let's talk about the team storylines. And you brought up Maryland. What a great story for the Terps. I know they didn't get to celebrate that win on Friday for very long because they had Penn State on Sunday, but they got to celebrate it for at least one full day. Really nice job by Alex Clemson. They are getting better. Rick, we talk about it every week. To win matches in this conference is extremely difficult, but you can see the pieces in place. Braxton Brown at 125 has done a really nice job. At 141 and 149, they got the Miller brothers. They're going to be very good. And at 197 with Jackson Smith, he had that big pin on Friday night. They are getting better. They're building a program. It does take some time, but it was a really nice win for them. A couple of really good recruiting classes for Alex Clemson. And this was exciting. They were down by eight with two matches to go. There's the pin from Jackson Smith. And then it comes down to heavyweight. The crowd is into it. Good match. Got to his offense, Jaron Smith. He's been with Maryland for eight years. It had to feel great for him to get that win. And again, into the corner, your teammates are fired up. Some great footage from the locker room. You got to celebrate the victories in this conference, big and small. As you said it before, they didn't have a whole lot of time to celebrate, but that was great to see with the Terrapins. And in this conference, there's nothing easy. First dual win since 2016, and to get it, the Terps had to win four of the last five matches in that duel. So the known commodities were Penn State and Iowa heading into the year. They're still sitting at 1-2 in terms of Big Ten teams in the national rankings. Let's look outside that group. As heading into the year, we were wondering, could someone else step up? Could it be Ohio State? Could it be Michigan? Could it be Nebraska? So outside of Penn State and Iowa, which team grabbed your attention the most during Big Ten action? I think it's got to be Nebraska. Look at what they lost. They lost Chad Red, four-time All-American. Ridge Lovett, red-shirting. He lose. Taylor Vans, an All-American. Eric Schultz, an All-American. Christian Lance, an All-American at those upper weights. But, man, look at Liam Cronin at 125. Brock Hardy's been spectacular at 141, ranked in the top 10. Mikey Labriola, Peyton Robb, that's your 1-2. 
and they're both undefeated. Silas Allred, Lenny Pinto. They've just gotten contributions up and down that lineup. Mark Manning in Nebraska have really impressed me. I like how Minnesota competes. Ohio State's going to be there in the end. Michigan, they lost a ton, but they're getting better. They're getting healthy. They'll be a team to keep an eye on down the stretch as well. This conference, Rick, is just so good. And at the end of the day, Jim Gibbons always says, talent shows up. And the Big Ten's got some talent. I love what Nebraska does under the barbell. That is the all weight room team. You look at them <laughs> at every weight, they are jacked up, no one more so than Mikey Labriola at 174. Individual storylines, one of the few bright spots for Michigan in that loss to Iowa was Mason Paris once again getting the better of Tony Cassiope. And Shane, we discussed this before the show began. Mason Paris kind of underappreciated despite all the great things he's done in that maize and blue singlet. Going back to 2020, Rick, he lost to Gable Stevenson. He's lost to Greg Kirkley, who he just beat a couple weeks back. And then he's lost to Colton Schultz of Arizona State, a national finalist. This guy is really one of the all-time greats. He's undefeated, beat Kirkley, as I mentioned. A really nice job on Friday night. Had to battle back to come back to beat Tony Cassiope. That was a wild match. He wins at 9-7. Mason Paris has great leg attacks, and he's very good in that top position. That'll be critical for him down the stretch, but this guy can win a national title. No doubt about it. Put a stamp on his career in that Mason Blue singlet. 23-0 this season, now 4-0 over Cassiope, and doing it in a heavyweight division that has been loaded. Sure, Stevenson's gone, but you still have Cassiope, you still have Kirkfleet, you still have Davison, the top four heavyweights in the country, all wrestling inside the Big Ten. Let's go to those middleweights and the emergence of Iowa's Kobe Seabreck takes down the All-American Will Lewan of Michigan this week. Shane, we have watched week to week. He's getting better to better, better and better, and you can see he's getting more and more confident with every match he wrestles. He's a great story. He's from Lisbon, Iowa. Really good athlete. He was in wrestling. I believe he played baseball, golf, cross country, track and field. Really good athlete. He's unorthodox. He's got some funk. He's got a unique style. He can let it go. He's a home run hitter against Iowa State. He put Kreiser on his back. That got that Carver crowd into it. Uh, he had a big pin against Anthony Artelona in the Hawkeyes win against the Quakers. I mean, people like to watch guys that let it fly. And Seabrick against Will Lewan, that was a crazy scramble. He was dead to right. Exactly. How did he do it? I don't even know if he knew. He said, I just kind of cartwheeled or kicked over the top of him, and he got it done. But that's what people like to watch, Rick. Colby Seabrick is one of those guys that when he toes the line, you're talking to your buddies. You can say, hey, let's hang tight. Let's go watch Seabrook because yeah. he can do something Anything that can we happen. never expect. Exactly. And you got to love Iowa right now at those middleweights. You got Real Woods at 41. You got Max Murin at 49. Mm -hmm. Now you have Seabrook at 57. Patrick Kennedy looks really good at 65. Tom Brand's feeling really good about the middle of his lineup. And lastly, Yada, Yaya Thomas of Northwestern finishing up his Big Ten dual career. What a great career he's had for the Wildcats. He's been very good. He's been a staple in that lineup there in Evanston. Of course, he had that magical run two years ago, a 25 seed at the national tournament. He beats five top 10 seeds to take third. It was a great run. Fell a little bit short last year, but 149 in the Big Ten. You got two, three, four in the rankings with Austin Gomez, Sammy Sasso, Yaya Thomas, of course, Max Murin's in that mix. Yaya Thomas beating Max Murin for the first time this year. He's going to be in the mix. Really good leg attacks. He can be stingy in that top position. You take those guys at 149, Rick, throw them in a bucket and see what happens. 149 in Ann Arbor. Going to be a great weight class to watch play out. Thomas with a career high 19 wins this season. And you know the Wildcats. They always step up at the Big <laughs> Tens. You forget about them, and then the next thing you know, they're on the podium. Well, you mentioned Sammy Sasso. He'll be part of the show. We'll take a quick break. When we come back, we get to chat one-on-one -on -one with Ohio State's outstanding 149-pounder. Everybody's favorite segment is back. Shane, with this week's edition of Tough Wrestling, and coming up a little bit later in the show, we rank the top three Big Ten wrestling duels of the year. Simply put, he's one of the best in the country at 149 pounds. Ohio State Sammy Sasso coming off that third period pin of Dane Morton over the weekend and kind enough to join us. Hey, Sammy, I know it's just one point 
in the team standings. The Tech falls worth five, the pins worth six. But from a wrestler's perspective, how much different, how much more enjoyable is it to hear the referee's hand, boom, slap that map before the match is over? Yeah, you always, uh, you always want to get a fall, you know. Um, that's the end goal in, in this sport. So um, whenever you get them on the back, you want to end it. Yeah, but at the same time, you stick to your fundamentals. I mean, those who know this sport know that you're one of the most fundamentally sound technical guys out there. How much time do you spend, even at this point in your career, as much wrestling as you've gone through during your career at Ohio State, how much time do you spend still focusing on the fundamentals and kind of techniques of the sport? Yeah, every day, you know, um, just coming into the room and um, just, just doing the things that you've been doing since grade school. And, and just finding ways to keep improving them. And uh, I got good coaches with me who, who look out for me and uh, you know they let me know when things need to get fixed. I think one other thing that folks that don't know this sport maybe overlook a little bit is the scouting aspect. Everybody in the world watched the Super Bowl and they know that for the last two weeks, the Philadelphia Eagles are worried about Patrick Mahomes. They're trying to figure out his tendencies. What does he love to do? What about for you guys, when you know you're going up against a guy who has a specific technique or a way that he likes to wrestle, how important is that scouting aspect leading up to the match that you'll have on Friday night, Saturday, or Sunday afternoon? Yeah, I always like to, to watch to watch my opponents and just see, you know, what they're doing and, um, you know, tendencies they have and, and things they like to do. But at the end of the day, it's just, you know, me being the best version of myself. Um, and get into what I do best. So, you know, you can't worry about what he's doing too much. You got to focus on yourself and make sure you get into your attacks and um, scoring from positions you like. Well, that's an awesome answer because it leads me right in to my question. What are you doing? What is Sammy Sasso performing on the mat when you feel like you are wrestling at your very best? Um, faking, moving, snapping, getting to the legs. They get on my legs, I score. Um, so yeah, when I'm at my best, I'm just floating out there, feet are moving, getting to my leg attacks, and then uh, just my leg defense is rolling. He gets a bite on my leg, and you know I turn it into points. You went to high school and are from Nazareth, Pennsylvania. I mean, that is the heart of wrestling in the United States. So just how wrestling crazy is Nazareth, Nazareth, PA? Yeah, you know, uh, I didn't, I didn't have nobody in my family who ever wrestled. And, but when you grow up in Nazareth, it's just, it's just part of what you do, and it's just part of the culture here in the in the city. Um, but yeah, I grew up in the Lehigh Valley, where every everybody wrestles and, and everybody pretty good at wrestling. So when you grow up in an environment like that, and especially a town like Nazareth, where everybody. Uh, is supporting you and and likes the wrestling team, you know it definitely is a is a factor and it lets you know that it, it's bigger than you, it's bigger than yourself. There's a lot of other people involved in this sport um, that are going to help you achieve your goals. Well, how does that perspective, that attitude, and the qualities that it takes to be a successful wrestler, the discipline, the work ethic, how has that kind of shaped and changed you as a person? Yeah, you know, uh, I was lucky enough growing up. I had a lot of good coaches. Uh, my old club coach, Van Dobish, he was he was tough and he got me right. But um, once I was in high school, you know, my high school coach, Dave Kroll, he was just, uh, he, he was something else, you know. And uh, he, as much as we enjoyed winning, um, that's not all it was about. It was about, you know, doing it the right way. And, um, he, he taught me a lot and especially just taught me that, you know, that it's bigger than myself and that I got other people around me that, you know, look up to me and things like that, that I got to be looking out for. And, um, you know, I was just thankful to grow up in a town like Nazareth and, you know, have coaches like Dave Kroll and Adam Colombo, who, you know, inst instilled some, some good traits in me. All right, Sammy, quickly, let's finish here because I always love to get one non-wrestling question in with the guys so we know something about you that maybe folks didn't know in the past. And a spy of mine who looks a lot like Shane Sparks told me that he found out that you just got your driver's license within the last, like, six uh -huh. to nine months. What's the story behind that? 
Um, yeah, when <laughs> when I was in high school, um, well, a ever since I was young, like, you know, I, I could get a ride anywhere pretty much. You know, I had people who, who looked out for me. So when I was in high school, um, I, didn't, I, I just didn't really need it. I had everybody, you know, someone could always come scoop your boy up um, and get me to where I needed to be. But, and, and in college, you know, I had good roommates, Gavin Hoffman, you know, shout out to my boy. He uh, he always looked out for me. He would get me to a workout. If, if I needed to go to the room, he, he would get me there. Um, and then just at, at this point in my life, I was like, all right, it's time. So um, we went and got it and then got myself a whip and uh, yeah, it, it worked out good. So now I, I enjoy driving. <laughs> He's got his own license. He's got his own car. No more Uber Sasso riding around Columbus. Hey, Sammy, <laughs> we truly appreciate the time. Wish you the best of luck rest of the way in the Big Tens and, of course, in the NCAAs as well. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. All right. Great to get to know Sammy Sasso a bit better. We'll take a quick break. When we are back, Shane is back. You know what's coming next. Two words, tough wrestling. You better be tough. A new segment this season called Tough Wrestling. I love this segment. It fires me up. I'm in a full ladder right now. Hard speeding. I love it. You never, ever give away those cheap points. Wrestle tough. Stay on top. It is that time to feed our appetites for some tough wrestling. Let's get right to it with Kill Carlson, Minnesota. This is a little bit different. He does not win this match, but he competes so well. Wrestling Dean Hammity of Wisconsin, who's really tough. Carlson fights out of a, a couple of really tough positions in this first period. Now it's 5-1, third period. Hammity in position for some possible bonus points, but Kill Carlson competes, gets a takedown on the edge. It's a loss for Carlson, but he keeps it a regular decision. The Gophers win the duel. That was big. How about Ed Heavyweight Lucas Davison of Northwestern, fourth ranked in the country inside of a minute. Good crisp takedown, slides that leg in. This is where he's gonna be really tough in that top position. Finish periods on top, a tough mat return right into the Resolite, keeps it a two nothing score to that second period. Here he is in the third period, up three nothing. This is the final match of the dual meet. Tax on two more. Lucas Davison, remember, this guy came up a couple years ago from 197. He's been fantastic at heavyweight. Max Mirren, this guy is tough, tough, tough. Short time, 15 seconds in on a leg, keeps his lower body active and drives through. But we know with Max Mirren, it's just a mentality. This guy wants to go to deep waters and he wants to brawl. 7-3 match, 121, you can't shut down. A lot of guys might shut down right here, but not Max Mirren. He's looking for two more points on a single leg. Right now gets behind the hips, scores the takedown. Max Mirren always beat up. His face has looked like this since he was in sixth grade. I'm convinced of it. I mean, look at that shot of Max Mirren. Here's Bo Bartlett, just one loss on the season, and there's a reason why, because it's tough wrestling. 25 seconds. Really nice job there to get the takedown in short time. Able to clear his head, brings his left arm around, and late in this first period, the Nittany Lion scores the takedown. Beginning of the second period right here, winning the whistle. Really good job of this right here. Gonna ride him for a little bit. There's that bad return. It's like moving the sticks. It's a third or fourth down play on the gridiron. 40 seconds left in the second period. He continues to stay on his offense. Nice single leg, gonna stay patient. Oliveri, the Scarlet Knight, putting up a really good fight, but there Bartlett able to bring him down, gets an opposite ankle and scores the two. The quick escapes, these themes, it's every single week with the tough wrestling. Good escape by Bo Bartlett. But again, stay on the offense, look at this. 30 seconds left, he brings him down to his back. He almost got the fall, that is a six, Point flurry. You always want to get greedy. You always want to get more, and that's what Bo Bartlett did. But here's Mikey Labrioli, the jump yard dog with Mike Labriola, 4-4 match. This sequence actually started about a minute ago. These guys have been scrambling on the edge. The match is on the line, and Mikey Labriola, somehow, he defies physics and gravity, 
This guy's one of the best scramblers of any weight in the country. Here he is on the edge. Great mad awareness. He knows the situation, locks up that cradle, goes into the Cavelli Center and beats Ethan Smith, who's a really tough wrestler. And then on Sunday, this is one of the best scrambles I've seen all year. They just keep scrambling and scrambling. And Mikey Labriola, doesn't stop wrestling the position, and there you go. Good man return once again. Mikey Labriola remains undefeated, the number 274 pounder in the country. He is gonna be a tough out. Mikey Labriola, if I'm going into a back alley, give me Max Mirren, give me Mikey Labriola, give me a couple other guys, but I want those guys, Rick, in my This corner. is Labriola, he's like the Hulk. <laughs> he's that guy that leads that he's all a dog. locker room team he's a from dog. Nebraska. But I know that you wanted to see more of Max Mirren. and you said you believe his face has looked like this since the sixth grade. Yes. The shots that we got <laughs> of Max Murin after that <laughs> Iowa duel, wrestlers are just built different. Well, Murin is certainly built different from the neck up, that's for sure. He's so tough. I just love the way that he looks. That's his shield. He always leads with his face. As good as 149 is going to be, nobody in that NCAA bracket wants to be in the same side <laughs> knowing that they will have to face Max Murin to win it all. One final break on this edition of Big Ten Wrestling and Beyond, but we are back to count down the best. Shane's top three Big Ten duels of the season revealed right after this. With Big Ten dual season now all wrapped up, we gave Shane the nearly impossible task of combing through the archives and coming up with the top three duels of the year. I don't know how you did this, my friend. It was not easy. There were so many really good duels, a lot of close ones, great crowds, record viewership. This was a lot of fun, this Big Ten dual meet season, but I got a few that really stand out. All right, so we whittled it all the way down to the top three. We're going to count down from three to one. In order, Shane Sparks' top three Big Ten duels of the season. I like rivalries. Northwestern and Illinois for the Battle of the Land of Lincoln. This one had some really good individual matchups. It came down to the final match at 125 pounds. Michael D'Augustino of Northwestern. He needed to get a major decision, but he also had to score a boatload of points. He puts a 10 spot on the board, gets a takedown and a turn inside of 30 seconds. And on total match points, Northwestern gets it done. 18-17 over Illinois. That was a lot of fun. Yeah, that was an absolutely unbelievable finish. We didn't see it coming the way that it ended up. At number two, Iowa involved once again. This was a record crowd at the historic UW Fieldhouse in Madison. Iowa got off to a quick start. Spencer Lee gets a pin over All-American Eric Barnett. But the Badgers come back, highlighted by the big toss of Tyler Dow. He pinned Ava's side at 184 pounds. That place went crazy. It came down to the final match. Tony Cassiope beats Trent Hilger, and this one also goes to criteria. Hawkeyes win it total match points. That was a great Sunday afternoon in Madison. So close to what would have been a huge upset for the Badgers. No surprise at number one, Hawkeyes Nittany Lions. Anytime it's 1-2 in the country, Penn State versus Iowa. Bryce Jordan Center, 16,000 people. It got really loud at 133 with Roman Bravo Young. There's Micah Parson. He was loving it. It came down to the final two matches. Max Dean victorious at 197 pounds over Jacob Warner. And then at heavyweight, Greg Kirkley beat Tony Cassiope. Penn State gets it done again. But they had to win the final four matches starting at 174 to get there. Micah Parsons not only was there, but he got to celebrate with Roman oh, Bravo he's... Young afterwards. <laughs> good buddies, great stuff. As always, good stuff from Shane Sparks as well. For Shane, I'm Rick Pizzo as we wrap up this week's edition of Big Ten Wrestling and Beyond. We'll see you again next week.